Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my foot and a light on my path. What word are we talking about? Torah. Shout it out. Torah. Torah. Your Torah. What is Torah? It's the first five books of Scripture. Your Torah is a lamp for my foot and a light on my path. Wait a minute. In all of our translations today, Torah is translated as law. Is a law. Does anyone sit here? Does anyone sit with the Wisconsin State Statutes book and study it before they go to bed? If, you, if you're the, that kind of person, I'm going to steer clear of you at the Oneg because you're going to be really boring. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not judging you. I'm just using discernment. And if A plus B equals C, I'm going to fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> no, because a law, the Wisconsin State Statutes, you don't need the book in order to know what is right in order to live in this state. You're going to be caught by surprise sometimes. When I was a young man, I was going to take my little sister bow hunting, bow fishing at Turtle Creek and was really surprised, and not by joy, but by the game warden, when we pulled up, got my bow out of the trunk, and it wasn't in a case. And I don't know, I think they're paranoid about drive-by bow shootings here. But I got a ticket for it, even though it was in the trunk. Okay. Listen, are the Wisconsin state statutes a lamp for our feet and a light for our path? No. No. You see, laws of man, they don't teach us how to live our life. They don't teach us how to interact with each other or interact with God. However, the Torah of God, which is a word that actually means instruction... The instructions of God, when God gives you instructions, those instructions tell you how you're to put your feet in this dark, wretched world, right? Your word, your Torah, your word is a lamp for my foot and a light on my path. Last night, our goofy cat Gordon got out. He was in the backyard, and he was out there for quite a while. And I got up about 8.30, which tells you how early we went to bed. We're old. We're allowed that. Uh, <laughs> prematurely old, maybe. But I went out, and I took a flashlight with me. Why? Because we have, a, we have big dogs, and I don't want to step in something that is going to ruin the rest of the evening. Listen, that light that I was using is very bright. When we take our eyes off of God's word, when we quit walking our life out according to the word of God, and we walk our life out according to how our hearts feel, follow your heart. What happens? Number one, we're being governed by something that God says is deceitful and above all desperately wicked. Number two, we're going to start obeying our flesh. And we're going to come away from that little saunter stinking to God. We won't be pleasing to him. We will be odious to him. We might still be his children, but we'll be stinky. What does a stinky kid have to do? They've got to be washed, right? Washed. That's right. They've got to be washed. They've got to be cleaned. Then once the child is cleaned and washed, what happens if the kid goes back out to their old stinky ways? And there's discipline, right? Shh, shh, shh. 
And there's discipline because I just washed you. You went right back into it. Don't do that again. But yet that's what we keep doing. Why? Because we despise his word. I don't despise his word. I love his word and I study it. Okay, but you're only studying parts of it. You're only studying the parts that you like. You ever hear a senator quote the Bible? You ever hear a president quote the Bible? It's always nauseating. And you always feel like you're on thin ice. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful I'm not standing beside them. (laughs) Then he says... I have sworn an oath and confirmed it, that I will what? Observe your righteous rulings. What are God's righteous rulings? His commandments, his Torah. Wait a minute, I thought Torah's bad. Not according to Paul. Remember old Rav Shaul, who, who wrote, God's Torah is holy It's just, and it's good. But because we manipulate Scripture, because we put words in God's mouth, because we put words in the mouth of his prophets, we twist things, we make things that are written say what we want them to say because it fits our traditions. I am very much distressed... Adonai, give me life in keeping with your word. Please accept my mouth's voluntary offering, Adonai, and teach me your rulings. This is a guy who made an oath to God that he was going to try to keep God's rulings. He's very much distressed. Give me life in keeping with your word. It's a tree of life, right? Don't we sing that? That comes straight from the Psalms. God's word, God's Torah is a tree of life. Then he says this, I am continually taking my life in my hands. Think about it. When you go out, you get up off your knees in the morning and you go out about your day and you start interacting with those people around you. We won't even leave the house yet just our family members. Aren't we taking our life into our own hands? I mean, if Mercy hasn't had her coffee yet, no. (laughs) No. No, we're taking our life into our own hands because at every interaction, we have the opportunity to walk in pride and arrogance and to sin, right? Right? to start glorifying ourselves instead of glorifying our Father. Every opportunity, every time we open our mouth, there's that chance. We're taking our life in our own hands. What's the answer? Yet I haven't forgotten your Torah. I'm continually taking my life in my hands, yet I haven't forgotten your Torah. It's the anchor. It's the pavement for that road that we walk. It's the illumination for how we're supposed to take our steps. Yet the wicked have set a trap for me. I think this could be a prophetic passage, speaking of these end days the wicked that teach that we're supposed to defile ourselves before our God? The wicked have set a trap for me. What's the purpose of that trap? Let's read on. Yet I haven't strayed from your precepts. You see, the purpose of that trap that these wicked people have laid for him is to get him to stray from God's word. How many times do we run into it where somebody says to us, oh, you can eat whatever you want. You don't have to just stick with food. You can eat whatever you want. We have freedom, man. You can live however you want. 
There's going to be grace to cover it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now you're teaching me to try to violate God's word. Yeshua himself had some words to say about teachers like that. He said they'd be least in the kingdom. See, there's a correlation here. I take your instruction as a permanent heritage. What kind of heritage? I'm hard of hearing. What kind of heritage? Permanent. Permanent, yeah. Permanent. What does permanent mean? Thank you. Forever. Means it doesn't stop. Perpetuitous. Don't ask me to spell that, Mom. Your, I take your instructions as a permanent heritage because it is what? It's a burden? No, it's a joy of my heart. It is the joy of my heart. But yet we're told that the Old Testament was so burdensome and so heavy and so difficult to walk out that God did away with it. No, he didn't. No, it was so perfect and so beautiful that God says, okay, now that you're obeying me and now that you're listening to me, I'm going to take it one step further and give you greater revelation and I'm going to put it in your heart. Because what happens when we start obeying God? When we start obeying him, then we start hearing him. When we start hearing him and listening to him and paying attention to him, and waiting for his very breath, then what happens? Greater revelation. I take your instruction as a permanent heritage, which is why I pass it down to my children. Because it is the joy of my heart. You see, God's word, God's commandment are a joy. When you can start studying his Torah, spending a lifetime studying his Torah, and you still can't wait to get back to it? And when you're going through your daily life and the Lord says, you see this, what you've been doing right here, led by my spirit, here's where it's found in Torah. We had a conversation on Thursday night as we were leaving about what it means to not harvest to the corners of your field. How many of us have fields full of grain? No, no, one, no one raised their hand. Well, I guess we're exempt. No, you're not. You're not exempt. What was it for? God says, don't sow to the corners of your field. Why? Because the widows, the poor, and the goyim, the foreigners who are living amongst you, are going to come, and that's what they're going to survive on. Remember Boaz? He let people come behind and pick up what the harvesters left. So how does it look in our lives? You ever heard of tipping? You buy a service, you leave a tip. Well, I just leave tracts because that's the best tip I can leave. No, 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 don't. Please, just leave the tract in the car. Start living it. Start living it. Instead of shouting and clanging and telling everyone how cool you are and how knowledgeable you are, no, no, no. Start living it. Do justice in here. Do mercy to everyone out here. And what? Walk humbly. He finishes with this. He says, I have resolved to obey your laws forever at every step. Because we have a choice. Each moment as we walk through our life, we have a choice. Am I going to do what God has commanded? 
or am I going to stray and do what I want? You have that choice. Why does God give us that choice? Because he wants us to demonstrate our love to him through our obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, the commandments of Christ are that we love one another. No, no, no. What did he say was the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Two of the greatest commandments, the greatest and the second. What he was doing was he was using a merism as a type of figure of speech. And he was saying all of the commandments either fall into one of these two categories. Love the Lord your God or love your neighbor. Loving the Lord your God is primary. Loving your neighbor is secondary. If you're loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you will love your neighbor. So when we say that the com command of Messiah, the law of Christ, is to love one another, that's only half of it. The other half is to love the Lord your God. Well, I'm with you, Rabbi. But that's a merism. That means all of the commandments. That's the bookends. That's what all of the commandments fall into, one of those two categories. I have resolved to obey your laws forever at every step. Listen, if you are going to throw out the Torah of God and say that it is not applicable, then how on earth are you going to read Psalm 119? Oh, I'm just going to replace that with the whole of Scripture. But that's not what was written. We can't impart what meaning we would like today into what they understood it back then. You see, hermeneutics require that we look at what the original intent of the author was. The original intent. Not what it speaks to me today. What was the original intent? And then the responsibility is to align your heart with what the original intent was. Because the original intent, as breathed in that man's spirit by God's spirit, is holy. It's just. And it's good. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that we get to be here today on your Shabbat. Remembering your Shabbat, remembering the sacrifice of Yeshua, remembering with joy that you commanded us to stop and rest. And as part of that stopping and resting, to come together with a holy convocation and worship you. Father, I pray that the worship that we bring before you today will be pleasing to you. If there be one of us that needs to be washed, wash us, Lord. Wash us now. So that we can be clean before you. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.